So hello everyone, my name is Rob Curley, and it's an absolute pleasure to be with you today. And welcome to your first breakout session of DDD Perth 2021. And in this session, we'll be exploring what it takes to think like a CTO. So many of the talks that you'll see today will cover the myriad new technologies, architectures, products and frameworks that we have available to use. This talk's gonna be a little bit different. We're gonna be looking at how we give technology purpose, how we can derive value from it, and how we can assess its suitability to delivering a user or business outcomes. And the agenda for the next 45 minutes together it's a little bit ambitious. We're gonna start with a not so gentle primer on strategy, what's involved, there's discrete thinking tools we have, and the other areas pertaining to being, creating a set of decisions of folklore within your business for kind of defining how you'll win. We'll also look at personal growth. So the techniques that you can bring back to your company on Monday and start applying instantly. So whether you be in a leadership role or not. And we're gonna look at technology strategy from three main perspectives. First of all, we'll look at its purpose, how it relates to broader strategic goals. With this base level of understanding established, we're then gonna to pivot to how to define, communicate, and evolve a technology strategy. And finally, we're gonna look at making decisions. One of the critical parts of any strategy. How do you turn ideas into decisions and ultimately actions that will yield positive outcomes for your users or customers? So a little bit about myself. I am the head of engineering at VIX Technology, and at VIX we build transport solutions for entire cities. So if you're familiar with the Mikey card in Melbourne, that was one of the previous solutions that we've delivered. Before that, I was a principal consultant at Telstra Purple, where I worked with CTOs and CIOs on defining companies' strategic and technology strategies. I am also a member of the DDD Perth Committee, and I am in absolute awe of my fellow committee members and the incredible work they put in to bring events like this to the community. And I'm also available at Rob D. Crowley on the socials. And I do have a confession to make. I absolutely love shiny tech. But in today's talk, I really hope that I can change your perspective about tech technology just a little bit and be able to give you the tools to assess whether it's viable, whether it's the correct choice for the problem at hand and the outcome you're looking to achieve for your customers. So, I've used that word strategy quite a few times already. So what is strategy? So when in doubt, consult a dictionary. And our friends at Macquarie Dictionary tell us that strategy is a plan of action designed to achieve a long-term aim. So we can see a couple of things from this definition. First, we can see it's about making decisions and acting upon them. And secondly, that this activity is performed to achieve a long-term vision. Haha, <laughs> I've just done it again. I've introduced a new word, vision. And often, vision, mission, purpose, strategy, all of these words are used interchangeably in conversations, which creates a really muddied picture of what we're looking to achieve. So let's break them down. So what is a company's purpose? What's its vision? What's its mission? The purpose is really the why. Why does the company exist? And at VIX, our, our purpose is to connect people and places. It forms our true north. The vision, it's a statement of intent. It's the lighthouse. It then marks the statement of intent on the positive impact you will make on the world. So how will the world look different once you have delivered your work? The mission is the how. So to achieve the vision, you need to do some concrete set of actions. And this is where strategy comes in. The strategy uses the mission to achieve the vision. And that's very important to be able to break them down because the mission should be concrete, it should be actionable, it should be measurable. And that then forms the core of the strategy. So if you're thinking back, actually, I'm not the person who sets my company's purpose or my vision. Don't worry, 
you can still define an incredible strategy that leverages the mission to achieve the vision. And the first thing we need to realize about strategy is it cannot live or exist in a vacuum. Without context, it is impossible to discern decisions or actions which are harmful or beneficial to the outcomes you're looking to achieve. We need to look at the context and the environment in which we operate. And this ability is called situational awareness, and it is table stakes for effective strategy. And this is how we can perceive, assimilate, and synthesize inputs from the context in which we operate. And in this context, the environment is the, the operating context. So the industry, your organization, your competitors all form part of this environment. And it is in a constant state of flux. And you can't control this flux. There's a global pandemic which has undermined many companies' strategies. A competitor could launch a new product that could be a new technology innovation that radically changes the environment in which you operate. And this is in constant flux. So for example, the global pandemic was a financial boon for companies such as Zoom, who offer video conferencing. Conversely, it hit WeWork's strategic plan very heavily. It still has all of the contracts on its side with the landlords, but its own internal occupancy plummeted. So through no fault of their own, a strategy that could previously have been effective has been undermined or changed radically. And the ticketing industry is no different. So the rise of COVID has driven cash out of a system, so contactless or EMV, being able to pay for travel with your smart cards has become predominant. But this is only the start. We can already see a pattern emerging whereby the ticketing industry will likely not remain standalone for, for long. You can see it being integrated with other services such as parking, possibly towards smart cities and single account-based government accounts. And you can see all of these things extrapolate based on this one large change to the environment. And there's a key point to make as well, is that competition drives evolution. Or to restate it, without competition, stagnation will result. And companies respond to changes in the environment at different paces. So if you take compute, for instance, previously we would have had our own data centers and we would have named our servers cute little things like Star Wars characters or Simpsons characters. But then co some companies early on said, actually, we can then use them as cattle, not pets. And they adopted IaaS, so EC2. But that was only the start of it. With the advent of serverless, with pay-as-you-go, that has gone from being a differentiator right the way through to a commodity, just like electricity. And as William Gibson said, the future's already here, it's just unevenly distributed. And companies respond to change differently. But you sometimes think the fastest will be the most successful. Let's turn the clock back to the early 1990s and look at a case where being first is not necessarily a precursor for success. So back in the early 90s, Netscape had about an 80% market share of the browser space. And it had a single product which it charged for customers and a lot of goodwill towards it. Microsoft, looking at this, look back. Maybe we don't need to take the first risk or foray into this particular product space because they knew that they had a 90% market penetration in desktop operating systems. So what did they do? They bundled Internet Explorer for free. So they had huge leverage in terms of their existing sales channels. And we were also in a case where customers, users suddenly gaining access to the Internet was life-changing. But it was also in a stage where they weren't incredibly savvy in terms of the differences or the nuances between one product and another. And so what we saw there is Microsoft ultimately won that with very little competition, and Internet Explorer became the predominant browser. But at the end of that first browser war, with, with no competition, 
Internet Explorer stopped progressing. It stagnated and ultimately gave rise to Chrome's ascendancy some years later. And Apple, we often think of Apple, I have multiple Apple devices, being the most innovative company in the world. If you look at their strategy, it's fundamentally based on being a fast follower. They look at something that someone has done before, they do it better, they think about the experience around it. But whether you have to be the disruptor at the, the, the start or the fast follower, it a lot depends on your market position. So if you have the ability to out-deliver a competitor, so if you're a big four bank, you might look at a fintech or a neobank, that could be an effective strategy. One, strat one strategy as well would be to acquire. But if you cannot outbuild or outdeliver your competitor, then a, a fast follower strategy is doomed to fail. There's another aspect that I'd like to explore as well, and I'll introduce the Cano model. And this is typically used to prioritize features on a product roadmap based on the degree that they're likely to satisfy a customer need. And we will have certain features, certain capabilities that will be attractive such that if you fulfill them, you will get disproportionate goodwill and market leverage. But then there are other features which are considered must-haves. So you wind the clock back a few years, facial recognition on your phone. That was absolutely an attractive feature, but now it's becoming commonplace. If you don't have it, customers will not buy your product. It will no longer be the differentiator for customers to go out and choose yours. And there is a trend here that over time, attractive features become must-haves. The market moves. And it's the same with technology. The novel becomes commonplace and in turn enables the creation of more complex innovations. The commonplace enables the novel. So again, the commodification of storage and compute, it's not just about that and doing pay as you go. In turn, that has given rise to innovations with big data and machine learning that would previously have been unattainable. So again, it's looking at cycles and understanding that in your business, there will always be phases that have some areas where you want to break new ground and other areas where you just want to stabilize. And the key thing is we have to use appropriate methods for the domain at hand. So if you use a one-size-fits-all approach across your entire organization, it will be suboptimal by definition. You will have some areas of your business where you want to disproportionately invest and innovate, and others which you want to stabilize. So is there, again, some prior art that we could look at around this? So Kent Beck, you might know him from his days at Chrysler and XP. But while he was at Facebook, he created a model called 3X, which has three main phases, explore, expand, and extract. So on the y-axis, we have payoff. And that's success from a business perspective. Are we making money? Is it succeeding? Is it good for the business? And on the x-axis, we have customer success. Is it delighting customers? And we are looking for win-win scenarios. And when we begin, we're looking for product market fit. We're exploring, we're building to learn. As we gain attraction, we get more customers, we're then looking to expand. So we're, we're looking at making it scale. And finally, we're looking at extracting. So how do we make the most money, the most value off of this, while still keeping that customer satisfaction? And our focus changes at different points. So at the beginning, we're looking to eliminate uncertainty. And what's a good delivery method for that? Agile, feedback loops. But in the center stage, we're then looking at expanding. So in this case, we're looking to eliminate waste, because any waste in our operating model will be magnified based on the number of customers we have. So in this space, actually, lean techniques are incredibly powerful So looking at forms of Muda and eliminating waste. Whereas right up at the right-hand side, you might just have an incredibly stable offering, but you want to eliminate variability. So again, structures from there like Six Sigma, which have a focus on reducing defects, is incredibly powerful. So again, understanding what methods to apply and when is incredibly important to be able to define the focus and the leverage points in your systems as well. So if anyone says to you, Agile is universally better than X or don't use Y. You have to understand the context and you have to understand what you're looking to achieve at that point in time. And there's also a corollary that our risk appetite over time decreases. So at the start, we're building to learn. We're looking for a fit. 
And if it doesn't work, that's fine. We haven't invested that much. But if we have a large number of customers, huge amount of investment, then again, our risk appetite slides considerably. So again, being aware when you talk about products and teams, what is the operating context in terms of your offerings? So we talked about decisions, but decisions without actions are pointless. But at the same time, we have to be distilling information to make sure that the actions we take are well-reasoned. And this is possibly the single most important thing that we will talk about today. And this is the OODA loop by John Boyd, so a former US fighter pilot, and a lot of the material that I'm presenting today have its origins back in the work that John Boyd has done. And in it, he defines a loop for critical decision making. And we, and we start with observation. So again, that's looking at the environment and sensing outside circumstances. That could be new technology launches, competitors launch a rival product, changes in, again, outbreaks. Anything like that could affect your business from there. The next stage is orientate. So again, based on that input information, how should we respond? Where do we position ourselves? How does that change our model of the world? Then finally, you look at hypotheses. What can you do based on this new information? And based on those hypotheses, you then select options. And once you have selected an option, you then act. So test, probe, and implement using doctrine. So doctrine being your how in terms of Simon Sinek's golden circle. It's the secret source. That built up experience and processes in your company. And the quicker you can do this, the more quickly you will be able to adapt to changes in your environment. And the key takeaway is that strategy is not a linear process, but an iterative cycle. You cannot create the best strategy at a point in time and have it as a guarantee for future success. It's constantly being able to refine it and adapt it based on new information coming in and then being able to cheaply validate those hypotheses. So strategy, it's really an informed opinion about how to win. There is an element of a crystal ball to it, but again, you're looking to assimilate that information and then based on those beliefs in those actions that your company will see future success. It requires an iterative approach with high context feedback loops. And competition is constantly driving change in your environment. If you want to really begin your journey in terms of defining strategies, learning that broader context, both within and outside your company and industry is incredibly valuable. Situational awareness is the primary capability you need. And that actually sums up what I just described as well. And leveraging models such as the OODA loop and 3X, there's numerous others. So I have in the slide deck, I've shared many more models as well that I haven't presented to you today. But then also, strategic thinking is a skill. And like any skill is subject to the Dreyfus model of skills acquisition. We will start as novices, and at some point we may attain mastery, but it will take time and dedication. So with that, let's turn our attention to technology strategy. And again, let's start with a quick definition. So technology strategy, a collective set of decisions around the use of technology and related factors to achieve a business or end user outcome. Key takeaway is an effective technology strategy amplifies your business strategy. If it does not improve the primary outcomes your business are looking to achieve, then it is not a good technology strategy. So any of the measures that you have around it should be anchored in the user needs of the business outcomes you are looking to achieve. And in terms of defining it, going long form in a document and writing the technology strategy down is vital to making it accessible. I was actually a little bit unconvinced about this until I, I did a consulting gig while I was at Telstra Purple at Bank West. And we did quite a number of activities in, ter in terms of defining the technology strategy for APIs, for data, for analytics. And the level of engagement that garnered and increased understanding across the development teams was extraordinary. And we're gonna go through this section reasonably quickly. So, for two reasons. There's a ton of material that I will link in the resources slide at the end, but there's also information that's probably best learned and dissected by yourself as well. But we'll go through the quick 
cliff notes so you get an idea about the various concepts involved. So possibly oddly, we start a technology strategy by not talking about technology. We anchor it in the business need. So what is the technical strategy that would need to exist to support the business? And to do that, you need to understand the business context first. So that's where we start. From there, we define the tech landscape. So what does it look like in your organization today? The idea here is to build empathy. What are the constraints? What are the challenges that you're facing? Can you go full serverless architecture? Well, no, Rob, I have a mainframe over here. What are we going to do about that? So it's, again, making sure that we can build a, a technology strategy that's realistic, that references the truth of the organization at that point in time. But we also need to set a marker on a hill, a vision of where we want to be. And this defines the intended direction and the actions that are going to be taken to achieve that. It might be breaking down the monolith. It might be using strangler patterns to abstract the painful areas of your architecture. It might be embracing distributed communication and messaging. There could be many things that you could involve. But this is, again, building those principles that will then get your architecture or your technology strategy from A to B. And then there's the principles and guardrails to enable effective distributed decision making. Whenever we're looking at a technology strategy, you, your goal should be, how do I give the teams of the edge the context to make good decisions, rather than trying to centralize thinking into a, a centralized architecture team or similar. And being able to define principles and guardrails are key for that. So let's take a look at this. So, I'll share an example from MYOB, created by their former CTO, Simon Reich Allen. And, and their platform manifesto was written in a very similar way to the Agile manifesto. And they talk about so medium-term decisions over short-term thinking, stable technologies over the unproven, existing assets over new development. And there's a couple of things we can learn from this. Actually, remember that expand, extract model that I showed before, 3x? A lot of where MYOB are a stable, mature business. They've already gone through the eliminating uncertainty, and they're looking to eliminate waste in their systems now. They're looking to be able to scale out their platform. And what they're giving the guidance to their teams is to encourage decisions and actions, which are not about hitting an immediate goal, but the long-term sustainability of their platform. Then also documenting what your technology radar or scope is and making it visible to all the teams. So again, with a couple of clients, I have worked with a build your own radar by ThoughtWorks. Um, again, it's worked really well in some places, not in others. So again, use it with your own discretion. Your mileage may vary. But in terms of visualizing across the teams what matters and what's current in terms of adopt or trial or assess within your organization can be incredibly powerful. One word of warning, though, is have a lot of thought at the start about the level of fidelity that you want to go to, including every single library used by every single team will create a huge amount of noise and very little value. And the last part of that is documenting decisions. So if you're familiar with the architecture decision records pattern, it's very similar. It's about clearly articulating what you want to achieve in your changes, in your technology decisions, assessing options as they pertain to the success criteria, and then also defining why you chose a certain option. And that might be, we would have loved to choose option A, but for time pressures or cost pressures or skills within the team, we have chosen a different option. And that's about building empathy for the next people who join the team to understand why you're in a current situation. And it's incredibly valuable learning material for when someone joins your team. And remember, strategy is iterative. Treat this technology strategy document in the same way. Don't aim for perfection on the first pass. Time box it. So what I did at the Bank West, I think we did four weeks. So we did a, a whole lot of interviews and then shifted from feedback and then improved over a couple of iterations. And the key thing is share it with people during their inductions. When someone joins your team, walk them through that document. Treat it as a living artifact. So build in a review process every three months. Is it still current? Is it still adding value to the teams? So a couple of takeaways. So a technology strategy should amplify the business or user outcomes. And defining a long-form technology strategy document is an excellent way of doing things. And just like strategy and iterative process, the technology strategy should be defined in the same way. 
and ensure the technology strategy is visible. It will only add value if it's visible and it's embedded in the onboarding process across any team. Okay, probably my favorite section of this talk. So metrics, how do you actually measure if you're going in the right direction? So situational awareness, incredibly powerful, but user needs cannot be met by just becoming aware of them. That would be a think tank. We have to be able to make actions and deliver upon them. And I'll rejig, you're not gonna find this in Macquarie. This is my personal definition of a metric. And there's a few things I would like to point your, def your attention to. So it's a quantifiable measure of the performance of a business or a component of your business. And a change in the metric should inform whether the existing course of behavior should be continued or adjusted. So a metric is only valuable if it drives behavior within your organization. And a metric can be applied to an application, a, a business department, people, process, system, but it needs to drive behavior. And let's see how that might work in practice. So if we have an evolutionary system, and we will begin at the start. At any point in time, we will have a number of options that are presented to us. So the same way going through the OODA loop, we're assessing these options, and then we decide. So as we continue down and we test and we learn, are these improving our core measures? If they are, then we take them as successful candidates. And we can then move to point B. If they are not achieving the outcomes we would wish to see, then we have to change course, change direction. So metrics act as that guiding light of if you're doing the right thing within your business. And again, at any point in time, we have multiple options. Using effective metrics to guide our path through to some arbitrary end. And of course, with an evolutionary system, there is no end. But this is why being able to have a quantifiable measure is incredibly important. But again, the measure is only the start. It's being able to align your behavior to it. So I think I've probably said metric two dozen times already, and I said they're really important. But how should you go about choosing a good metric? How do you find these things that will guide you towards success? First, don't start with a metric. That's the key piece of advice. So a metric should be an output. So if you wanna begin, again, you go back to your work on Monday, figure out what's important to your organization. What's one of your goals? And then think of a couple of ways that you might go to satisfy that goal. Move the needle on one of them. Then what work would need to be done? There might be, a, there might be an existing team looking to progress one of those goals. And again, ideally, start executing that initiative. It's only at this point, once you have done those first three steps, that you should really think about a measure or a metric. And the good metric will be one to say whether they're making progress. And the single most important question you can ask yourself when you're defining a metric or throughout this process is, is this work aligned with the user need? And a good metric will be one that matters, one that matters to your users or customers. that You can do something about that's actionable, that you can change behavior around it, and that reflects your business performance. So more broadly, if we're gonna anchor our metrics based on customers, you can look at Dave McClure's pirate metrics, which then map each phase of a customer as they might relate to your business. So we can start with acquisition. So how do your users find you? You might have certain metrics about how do you bring people to your product? Once they found you, how do you sign them up? How do you give an excellent first experience to them? Then it's about retention. So once they've used your product once, how do you keep them coming back? How do you continue to deliver value for them? With referral, how do you turn these users into advocates for your product? How do they tell others? Then how do you make money from them? And I should point out that these are a guiding light to be able to categorize where your users are and then think about questions or goals you would have and ultimately define the metrics off of them. These are not sequential, so you might have an area where revenue is actually incredibly important to your business. So you might immediately after activation then you're caring about revenue, and then later you might be caring about growth. So in this particular sequence, I have said that growth is really important, so I'm looking for market share, and then money and income is based on scale, not the percentage income per user. 
But being able to define metrics like this requires a certain level of data-informed decisions amongst your business. So again, this is something I do need to call out here. So in my multiple years of consulting, I have seen many organizations struggle with this because you can't suddenly start generating customer insights. It needs to start with data. And data needs to be categorized, cleansed, synthesized into information. And then once you catalog this information, you can generate insights from it. And most companies don't capture the data they would need to make informed decisions. So ex example, in a, in a banking app um, at Bank West, we saw that when a customer changed their name, we didn't do anything about it. We just saved it. But a customer could be changing their name for multiple reasons. They could be getting married. They could be getting divorced. How you would respond to that from a business context is incredibly different. But again, if you just do it at a CRUD operation, you lose a lot of that valuable context to understand how you should respond to it. So again, whenever you're building your systems, think about not what you're doing in terms of a data change, but the intent behind that, because that will then yield far greater insights down the line. And Simon Wardley, so the man behind Wardley Maps, he has also defined a set of doctrines, so universal best practices, irrespective of your industry, things that we should be doing to improve the ongoing success of our business. So again, universal patterns. And if we looked in the world of metrics, can we find universal metrics that are irrespective of your industry that are valuable to follow? And I feel there are. So in the work by Nicole Forsgren, Jess Humble, and Gene Kim and Accelerate, they've defined four DevOps State of the Union metrics. And just before we go a little bit further, so DevOps, it's a set of practices that work to automate and integrate the processes between software and IT teams so they can learn faster. You might see other things to go so they can release software better. It's not, it's actually about amplifying feedback loops. So again, being able to increase the speed or cadence with which you can release software, allow you to build your situational awareness. But the four metrics they've defined are as follows. So deployment frequency, we want to hire the number as possible. Lead time for change, we want this to be as short as possible. So the time from when we go to idea to production. We want mean time to recover to be as low as possible. So when we have a servit outage, how do we minimize the impact to our customers? And again, fail change rate, we want that to be as low as possible as well. So I'm actually gonna group these. So I'd say the first two is being speed focused and the second two being stability focused. So again, let's plot this on a graph. So on the Y axis, let's look at speed or productivity. And on the x-axis, we'll look at quality and stability. And we'll plot our metrics on it. And I will now introduce to you Crowley's non-scientific code of balanced behavior. So what we are looking at from here is as an organization with your risk appetite, how fast do you want to go? So are you actually comfortable increasing your change frequency at the cost of maybe a slight increase to your failed change rate? So again, being able to define these metrics that are actually in positive tension with each other then create balanced behavior within your teams. And in this model, based on your risk appetite and maturity, it is absolutely possible to have both speed and quality. But success is far from guaranteed. Let's look at a couple of examples where you can go wrong with metrics because it is a path paved in tears. The first is creating metrics that only focus on avoiding errors. How many people have a measure within your organization that says number of P1s in the last quarter? Ooh, there's a few, isn't there? I actually think that's a shocking measure, right? To be honest, the only thing that's going to drive teams to do is release less. Because when you do a release, it injects entropy into your environment and the chance of an incident increases. So if that's the only thing you're measuring your teams on, it will atrophy change. You need to balance it with a productivity metric as well that encourages teams to go faster. So again, don't build metrics on avoiding errors, build metrics on achieving excellence. There's also one of my favorites, so the COBRA effect. And this is defining a metric that is, has an intent of improving a situation, but actually does the complete opposite. These are known as perverse incentives. So let's look at an example. So back in the 1990s in New York and Pennsylvania, they, the health department started publishing stats around patients doing coronary bypasses. 
And the idea was that if you then publish that information about doctors who have the highest success rates, in this case, more, or lowest mortality rates, that you would then see the better doctors getting more of the work and the doctors with a poorer record getting less. It makes sense, win for the doctor, win for the patients. What we actually saw was that doctors stopped operating on really sick people. Because really sick people have the unfortunate habit of dying. And that's absolutely horrible because it's the exact opposite of the intent of that metric. But again, it's like I defined before, the metric only measured what axes of behavior and did not create a balanced situation. The Great Hanoi Rat Massacre is another famous example of Campbell's Law in action. We also have vanity metrics. So metrics that depict the rosiest picture possible, but they'll accurately reflect the key drivers of your business. So unless you're making money from ad impressions, then total page counts or total hits is likely not going to be successful. Cargo cult metrics. Choosing metrics of popular companies because they are successful, even if that context does not map to your own. I'm doing it because a successful company is doing it. All we're doing is imitating. And we're substituting imitation for understanding, and it's a beguiling shortcut, but it is one that is fraught in peril because you don't understand if those are actually aligned to your business drivers. Measuring outputs, what are the worst? Lines of code delivered by a developer. Total number of pull requests reviewed. So things that are outputs and not outcomes. These just create noise and add very little value across the board. Possibly one of the most evil, weaponized metrics. And this is using metrics for comparison and punishment rather than for continuous improvement. You might often see this from another department head saying, why have you increased your, your fail change rate? So why can't you deliver on time? So these are particularly toxic behaviors that you can see. And again, there's a law for everything. This is actually an example of Goodhart's law which states that any observed statistical regularity will tend to collapse when pressure is placed upon it for control purposes. Or another way of saying it, when a measure becomes a target, it ceases to be a good measure. So what should we do to confront this organizational anti-pattern? Remove information siloing. So again, having as much broadcast across the company around the metrics is a great way to remove some of the leverage from there. Ensuring that you have metrics that create positive tension between an actor's pairs rather than skewing towards a single outcome. Those are some of the key aspects that you need to, first of all, identify but prevent weaponized, again, focused on changing behavior for personal gain rather than business outcomes. So with metrics, pivot conversations to metrics rather than not actionable opinions. Customer needs, user needs, they're absolutely your key. Effective metrics often work in pairs, and metrics only deliver value if they influence behavior. So, in the last couple of minutes that we have together, what are things that you can bring back to your organization, and how should your thinking be applied to certain situations that you face yourself in? And I will, I will start with a, disclaim, a disclaimer here. The transition between delivery and strategic focuses is super difficult but it is one that is worth persisting with. Technical ability is unlikely going to be the constraint on the ability to grow your career. At some point, technical ability will take you to a point, and then being able to look more broadly around the solution will help. So invest in truly learning your business and industry, and that's vital to growing situational awareness. Learn the context, both within your team, your department, your organization, and the environment. This is a huge step change thing for you. And embrace empiricism, it's a great way to level up your influencing skills. So base metrics on, so base conversations on metrics rather than not actionable opinions. So I don't feel X, understand how soon do you need it? When do we need that by? Questions like that can help drive concrete answers in that case. And while you may not always have the authority to make a decision, you can always champion a cause. Work with leaders and other people to help push that direction. And build your network both inside and outside work. Hallway conversations, incredibly powerful. When you leave this breakout session, talk to your peers, talk to other people in the community, and start building your awareness of how the challenges that they're facing and what they're doing around it as well. If you're leading teams, focus on growing an environment that encourages the behavior you want to see. 
I would just a quick corollary that if you're trying to embed behaviors that run contrary to the incentives of your organization, it's not gonna work. So again, making sure that you're being authentic to the drivers of your business. So takeaways, strategy, iterative cycle. A technology strategy exists to amplify the business strategy. Looking at models such as 3X and the OODA loop can be key to increasing your situational awareness around it. Metrics are a key driver for delivering value and the direction for it, but be very careful that you're applying them in appropriate ways and that they're actionable and valuable to your business. And finally, go forth, be awesome. Hopefully what I've shared with you today is helpful. I doubt that we're gonna have time for questions. So what I'll do before we leave, I will share the resources slides and the reading list, which covers a lot of the material from today's talk. What I'll do is questions, I'll take them at the VIX stand, just by the coffee cart outside. And thank you so much. If you're looking for the slides, you can grab a picture now. Thank you so much. <laughs>